Good morning, church. Yeah, can you give her a hand? My name is Chris Yost, and I have the privilege of being one of your pastors here at First United Methodist Church of Rockwall. If you are a guest or you call First United Methodist Church your church home, I invite you to register. Uh, the books are at the ends of the pews. You can pass those down. As a note, please, if you have a prayer concern to share, fill out one of the prayer cards. You can put it in the offering plate, hand it to one of us in the North X, and we would love to be in prayer with you. So we have the fall studies. Uh, sign up is fully underway right now. Uh, there are multiple offerings. Go to the website, look at the adult education section, and you can sign up there for those. Today is the last Sunday that we are doing prayer apples. Prayer apples are a way that the entire church can pray for the children of our church over the coming school year. You can go out into the Connection Center, get one of those apples, put it somewhere to remember to pray for that child uh, throughout the year. We do have several left, but we're going to put a limit on no more than five apples per person. All right. Uh, I want to make note that September the 4th is kickoff for Reverb and Middle School. Reverb or elementary age. Uh, middle school is, uh, 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 that'll all happen on September the 4th. And third grade Bible uh, Sunday is coming up. Please make sure and sign up your third graders because we want to make sure that each child receives their Bible. At the close of today's service, we will have acolyte dedication. Following that is training. If your child would like to be an acolyte and the grade range is third through, sixth. third through sixth grade, it doesn't matter if they've already signed up or not. If they want to be an acolyte, they can come forward at the end of the service and then they can join for, for lunch and training afterwards. And one final note, we are so fortunate today. Um, Allison Hicks, our children's director, is celebrating a birthday and guess where she's spending it with us? <laughs> Right here. Happy birthday, Allison. With that, um, I want to invite you to rise and body or spirit. Greet one another, and if you need to keep your distance, just wave at those around you.
please remain standing for our affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I want to invite the children to come on down for sharing the gospel with children. What's up, ladies? Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Coming on up. Good morning. Better move up a row. There we go. You can make some room there. It is so good to be with you all today. So, you know, a lot of us have uh, started school or we might have uh, started new sports. Any of you uh, going to play sports this fall? Okay. And uh, let me ask you a question. When you start something new, is it better when you have a best friend with you or if you go by yourself? Best friend, best friend. We got one go by myself. That's your adventurer. Right? Yeah. It's better to not go by yourself. Yeah. And so how does it feel when you have somebody who's with you and you know they've got your back? How does that feel? It feels more like some support. You feel like you have that support. Yes. It feels comforting. It does. It feels comforting. What else? When you have somebody there with you and they're your best friend. Anything else? Uh, yeah? it, it can also feel more like you're not going to be alone and it's going to be more that you know that when you lose, you're going to be comforted. That's right. So you're never, you're not alone. You have somebody there with you. Yes. It, I know. She said, it's going to be more fun. You're my kind of people. That's right. When you have your best friend with you, it's just a lot more fun in life, right? You know, it's really great because while I've been here, I've heard Miss Allison teach you all as you were getting ready for school and all that. Like when you go to school, are you going alone? No. If you go uh, on an adventure, when we believe in God, are we alone? No. What if one of you were to go to Mars on a space trip? Would you be alone? No, it doesn't matter where you go, everywhere you go, if you are walking with God, guess who's with you? God is always there. And so whenever I have my best friend with me, do you think I'm worried? No. If, do you think I'm, oh, what's going to happen? No, my best friend's with me. And what scripture tells us is that God is closer to us than even our best friend. So everywhere we go, sometimes we do get a little bit nervous, right? That can happen. But then when we remember Jesus is even better than a best friend. So someday when one of you are on a space flight and you're going to the moon or one of you are going to Mars, you are never going to be alone because God is with you everywhere. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, you call each and every one of us, if we're a child of um, one year old or if we're a child of a hundred plus years old, we're your kids. And so, God, we ask that you would particularly bless these young folks in front of us today, that they would know what it is to call you their heavenly father, to know that you were going to walk with them everywhere. And that as life got, get a little tough sometimes, that they never need to worry because you are with us. We are not alone. In Jesus' name, amen.
invite the ushers to come on down. One of the things that amazes me in the life of the church, as I was thinking about our sharing the gospel time this morning, these are the kids that are going to make those grand journeys. So friends, what they get here might be what they take with them to wherever God sends them. So, um, oof, I get chill bumps. Just what a, what a, what a pleasure and joy. Um, friends, as we uh, prepare to present our tithes and offerings, uh, there are the grand things like the buildings that we stand in, and then there are the practical things like thank God for air conditioning, okay? Thank you for your generosity because on a day like today, um, your ties that you gave last month, that's what helps make all this possible today. Thank you. Let's pray. God, we uh, give you thanks and praise for our, the meaningful vocations that are represented in this room. We thank you, God, that uh, through them we might provide for our family, that we might provide for our church family and for your work here and throughout the world. In Christ's name, amen. sing together because he lives. Say
It is a holy and sacred thing to join as one faith community in prayer. If you are joining us online, we invite you to share a prayer request in the comments. You can also go to our website to share a prayer request, submit a prayer in the registration book, or go to our prayer station in Building A, and it would be our honor to pray with you. We pray for those hospitalized this morning, including Natalie Rickards, as well as those discharged from area hospitals, including Mary Shane, Jim Colwell, Bob Overholt, Bruce Ballard, and Mike Moore. We lift up Dana Fielder and family upon the death of her father, Billy McDaniel. Services were at Heritage Church of Christ in North Richland Hills yesterday. And we hold in our hearts the family of Glenna Phillips upon her death. Services are pending. We pray for our president, world leaders, military, and first responders. Let us pray. Dear gracious and loving God, we come before you today with hearts full of gratitude and hope. We thank you for the gift of this church family. As we gather here in your presence, we are reminded of your enduring love and faithfulness. We lift up to you our joys and our concerns. For those among us who are celebrating milestones and blessings, we rejoice with them and give thanks for your hand in their lives. May their joy be, re be a reminder of your grace and goodness. We also bring before you those who are struggling, those facing illness, loss, or uncertainty. Surround them with your comfort and your peace. Grant them strength in their weakness, hope in their despair, and healing in their suffering. May they feel your presence and know that they are never alone. Lord, guide us as a church community. Help us to always share your love and compassion in our world. Equip us to serve those in need, to advocate for justice, and to live out the values of your kingdom. Let our actions reflect your light and grace, and may our words bring encouragement and truth. We ask for your wisdom and direction as we continue to seek your will. Help us to be faithful stewards of the resources you have provided and to use them to build up your kingdom and make a positive impact in our community. In all of these things, we trust in you and your perfect timing. We lay our worries and hopes before you confident that you are at work in our lives and in the life of this church. We pray for all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now may we pray together the prayer taught to us by him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. So friends, today we're continuing our journey through uh, the Beatitudes where our Lord Jesus um, is helping us learn how to shape our lives to the kingdom of God. And today we're going to be talking about uh, perhaps a passage you've heard before where Jesus tells us to not worry. Now, as we're getting to know one another, one of the things I want you to know when I feel like, hey, this might be hypocritical, I want to raise my hand and just let you know up front, I don't have this down pat, okay? Um, God is still working on me as I'm telling you, don't worry. Look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. Um, Jesus is teaching all of us on today, okay? So I want to uh, make sure we're, we're good on that. But uh, on the heels of Jesus reminding the disciples that we don't store up our treasures on earth where rust and moth may take away, we're reminded that uh, our pursuit is of the kingdom of God, not um, uh, mammon, okay? In other words, the desire to control this world around us. And on the heels of that, we come to this teaching 
where our Lord Jesus is sitting on a hillside and gently rolling uh, uh, away are all these people. And if you have a visual imagination, here when I read this text, let's make a deal. If you want to close your eyes and let this scene wash over you, I will not think you're asleep. Deal? What I want to encourage you to do is to imagine yourself sitting in this field. And you're hearing Jesus, and he's already been teaching for a while. But all of a sudden, there goes a bird. And imagine the Lord goes, see the birds of the air? Because that's what we think he did. Whenever the lilies are growing up and he's trying to help people understand what it is to be dressed in the splendor of God's grace and love, he goes, consider the lilies of the field. And he was pointing at something growing there. So it's in that spirit that I offer to you this reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 25 uh, through 34. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive after all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you have need, uh, that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Friends, I pray that in the reading of this scripture that the word of God is revealed to you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your revealing yourself to us this morning through fellowship, through song, through prayer. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity where we can draw together. Together as the body of Christ, we're here to seek your word. So open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls in the ministry of your word. And God, I do pray that you hide me behind the cross and allow your living water to flow out of this earthen vessel. Amen. It's the middle of the night, and it is time to go to sleep. And if right now you just had this flash of anxiety, then this sermon is perfect for you. Friends, I want to tell you, I actually had to change the way I did my own prayer practice. Because when we say we're praying for you, I normally pray in the morning, in the midday, and in the evening, whenever uh, the, the day's about to wrap up. But without fail, for probably the first eight years of my ministry, I would lay down in my bed and I would start praying. Let me tell you, oh, I hope they're okay. Oh, I didn't call to check on. Well, did they do that? And it'd be midnight, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, why can't I go to sleep? Dear God, why can't I go to sleep? Right? If you have had any experience akin to that, like I said, this sermon is just for you. I, along with you, have a mind that um, once upon a time, if I could have got a Caesar Milan to come and train my brain like he trains dogs, it would be great. Can you imagine when your mind starts racing around and jumping on the couch, so to speak, that you're like, and all of a sudden it would just kind of stop, right? Well, friends, I'm not going to promise you that by the end of today's sermon that all you have to do is give a snap or a signal word and it all goes away. But what I am here to testify before you is that my life is significantly better than it was 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, and maybe even five years ago. 
that now when we go and orient our lives to this kingdom of God, that things indeed do get better, including what you might call the racing mind. First thing we have to acknowledge is that as human beings, you and I have been gifted with a unique skill set. It is a blessing that as creatures, you and I are to imagine a world that has not yet become. The part of the image of God that you and I were made with is that we can understand what it is to sow a crop today so that three months, six months from now, something comes out of the earth. Or in our ancient days of hunting the landscape where we could predict and imagine where the animals might be so that when we went for the hunt, we would find them when we got there. Friends, these are good things. These are gifts. But just like we talked about some month ago now, that sometimes those perfect gifts that we're given start malfunctioning just a little bit. And that's where the world does not operate just as it was made to work. And that, my friends, is where Jesus is calling us to reorient our lives into the kingdom of God so that that good thing that you have, that's like a dog that's out of control and runs its own little laps, come on back. Let us gather ourselves back into the place of God. So what do we do with this gift that has run awry? I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is, um, friends, obviously it's been happening a while because 2,000 years ago, Jesus took time at the Sermon on the Mount to address the crowd. So you're not alone in this. God is not unaware that this is an issue in our lives. And I will tell you that uh, uh, if you and I were to fall in line with the rest of the world, as Jesus says, um, the Gentiles or the ethnos is actually the word in Greek. It's all the people whose sole purpose in life is worldly success. In other words, their whole purpose is just to wear the right clothes, just to have the right things, just to control the world around them. And that's their pursuit. God bless them. Actually, let's do that in the Texas tense. Bless their heart, right? That's a rough run. That's a difficult journey to be on. But you and I are called to orient our lives towards God and then trust that the rest of it is going to be taking care of itself. Y'all, the world needs us to bear this light into it. Okay? We live in a world, the, the world is in a place of anxiety. The U.S. is in a place of anxiety, and I am violently neutral, so don't even talk to me about it, all right? What I am here to say is that you and I are called to be in the world, but not of the world. You and I are called to be vessels of a peace that the world will never be able to give. Its systems can't generate because it's just not in it. It's set up for self-gratification. It's set off for self-promotion. You and I are called to be the light in the dark. We're called to be the salt of the earth. How are we going to do that? Well, you and I, when we have these minds that like to kind of run on their own, we have to realize that we are an answer to somebody else's prayer when we can bear this kind of a light. I think it was about 15 years ago, there was a older gentleman who lived in Wichita Falls, who uh, when I was recognizing my frustration, I thought, well, surely I'm a pastor. I mean, you know, I have all the peace in the world, and why is my mind running away from me? And he went through and taught me a lot of really neat things, but one of the things he said that stuck with me, he said, you know, worry is like a rocking chair. Oh, it'll give you something to do, but you're not going to get very far doing it, right? Right? And uh, now some of us, worry is like a comforting place, right? It's this thing that we're kind of like, oh, good, right? Oh, I'm doing my righteous act by worrying. I I saw a meme a couple weeks ago, school was starting, and it had that ethos to it. And it was this mom very lovingly, like you could tell, glancing at her children as they were sleeping on the night before school. And she just says, rest well, children. I'm worrying for all of us, right? (laughs) Somehow we've got this thing warped. God loves us too much to leave us in that kind of a place. 
So what I'd like to share with you today is kind of based on what Jesus is offering to us today is to remember, first of all, that you and I have a choice. Think about it. You and I have a choice. You're not just subject to the mind and its own wanderings. You're not just subject to worrying about an unknown future. You're not just subject to anxiety. But the very first thing you have to do is to know God has empowered you to make a choice. Let's be fair. You're not going to decide one day that this is how it is and it's all finished because it's not. This is a discipline. This is a journey that we engage in as Jesus followers. If you've had a life of worrying, you're not going to jump out of that track just all of a sudden tomorrow. But if you will walk the kingdom of God path, the process by itself is going to get you to a place where you're going to find God completely and utterly at work. You have a choice. That's why Jesus says, are you going to be this way and trust God? Are you going to be this way like the Gentiles? What choice do you make? What decision? What's the orientation? What is the aim of your life? So uh, as I've had some conversations, some of you heard that uh, I was born in Richardson. I kind of grew up in North and East Texas here and but I actually graduated high school in Wabasha, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Wabasha Kellogg. Great folks. <laughs> it, really, they are the beautiful people. And I do mean that because some of them are watching. So, um, <laughs> um, but, uh, so our group took driver's ed together. And it was the classic Midwestern driver's ed person wore his fedora, and this was in, uh, well, 1990, so had a giant cigar, smoked it the whole time. It is sitting there, the whole, you know, I won't do all the hand signals, but you get the idea. But I will not forget what he taught when he said, when you're driving, particularly on a two-lane road, do not look at the headlights that are coming towards you. He said, pick a mailbox, Pick the stripe on the side of the road, or up there they have those giant um, uh, snow markers, you know, so that in the wintertime you don't, you know, you know where the edge of the road is. And the reason why what has your attention, you will tend to drive towards, okay? So if you're looking at the oncoming headlights, guess which way you're going to naturally start drifting. But if you pick something else, at least it's a little bit safer to drift that way than into oncoming traffic. So friends, when we talk about making this choice, just being aware that you can decide to be like the Gentiles or you can be a person of the kingdom of God. Deciding that that's your default position means that you're going to align yourself more with Christ than you are with the world. Does that kind of make sense? You have a choice, friends. And I actually wrote these out as a list, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to read these to you. Um, which brings us to the point where, where when you align your life, you have to align yourself with God. Now, there are enough of you in here that I am recognize your hair color. So I'm going to say that. How many of you took typing on an old typewriter? Okay, good. You will totally get it. And later, the people that had their hands down, please explain it to them, Okay. <laughs> So um, in typing class, there was always that one typewriter, and I happened to get it once, that, you know, you would be typing it, you know, your proficient 22 words a minute, and uh, you would hit the return button, and about a third of the way through the page, it would jump, right? It was, I don't know if the teeth were stripped or something happened, but all of a sudden, it was out of alignment. And if your typing teacher was like mine, if something was out of alignment, what did you do? You had to throw it away and start all over. Friends, when our lives feel like they're jolted out of alignment, um, the good news is God is not grading us and looking for the mistake. When we align our lives with God, it's a little bit more like a word processor. Yeah, now everybody's on the board, right? All you have to do is tab the little line and move it over and bam, everything's perfect, right? You and I have that ability to know that God is for us. God's not doing this to us. God is bringing us back into alignment with himself. 
Friends, I said it once, I'll say it a hundred times. You know, the, there are some parts of our Christian tradition that believe that it is the, the, the misalignments that define who we are. It's our mistakes that tell, you know, you, you, before God, you are this. Mm -mm, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you are called to be our, my father's children. Man, I know sometimes kids can get frustrating, but so let's do this. Think about a firstborn grandchild. Right? Are you looking for that kid's mistakes? Oh, even the mistakes, you're a little bit, well, it's still cute, right? You see him getting in trouble, you're like, come here, get a piece of candy, you know? <laughs> Obviously, God wants better for us than to keep messing up, right? But God wants you to find, God wants you to discover this peace that he offers to us. So as you're being patient with yourself, understand again that this is a sojourn. It's a soul journey. It's a process. And it's not the kind of thing that you're going to go through and make one decision and it's all over with. But that's one of the reasons I love being a Christian in the Wesley tradition is we know that every day is our salvation. That every day we're growing. There's an ING on that. We're growing in that pathway of God. One of the hard parts, and friends, I'll tell you, this is one of the areas I struggle with. Um, I, I like to write goals and then I achieve them, right? That's what I do. I get things done. <sighs> okay, just bear with me for a minute. And when they don't happen, oh, okay, you know what? We need to double down our efforts. Let's try this again. Let's figure out, let's... And sometimes I still get wrapped around that axle too, right? There's, and I'll get to it in just a few minutes, but friends, one of the things we learn in our walk with Christ is it's not because everything turns out just the way we want it that means we're a Christian. It means that we are walking in the path and that by its nature, the fact that God is walking with us, that is the Christian life, okay? And it um, chokes me up a little bit, to not in a good way. Um, uh, and I'm so sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm not an Alabama fan. Okay, I'm sorry. I know. It's all right. Just, and it's not because they're, let's be fair too, they're outstanding. Actually, Nick Saban is amazing. But I also will tell you, I was very happy for him when he retired last year. After seven national championships, come on, brother, leave some scraps for the rest of us. He is that good, and I do genuinely mean he is amazing as a coach. You just kind of get tired when you're like, I've heard that song before, right? But with that said, uh, Nick Saban, to his credit, has an amazing mindset with, that he, uh, he came to, to, to develop. And... He was asked multiple times over his career, you know, how, what, what guides that? And he said, know what you want to accomplish and focus on the process rather than the results. Okay? Focus on the process rather than the results. The way we talk about that in Christian terms is focus on the relationship and the rest of it will start taking care of itself. Who you are walking with will determine where you end up. Okay? So when we make our kingdom of God mindset, guess where you're, you're going to get somewhere really good because guess who's leading you? God's going to get you there. Which brings me to that earlier point about I like to set a, you know, this is our goal and this is what we're going to accomplish. Um, let me tell you, and, and, uh, and I mean this, if you don't have a 12-stepper friend, you need to go find one. I will tell you that our 12-stepper friends have helped me more to understand the process of faith than perhaps some of the best preaching I've ever heard in my life. Um, they, uh, uh, let me take a little side note with you. So when I was early in ministry, I was out in the country churches, right? And it's just wonderful people. There's great people everywhere. But um, part of what you do in a small town church is you go literally, like John Wesley said, house to house. So I'd have a visitation schedule and I'd go to people's homes. 
And all these houses, this is a lot, pretty, pretty far before stainless steel was everywhere. There were magnets on all these people's refrigerators. And on all the magnets was this prayer. And I didn't know what to think of it. And no offense, but I called it the little old lady refrigerator magnet prayer. Okay? <laughs> I know what else to call it. Over time, you know, you, you live in a church, you, you go with people through their highs and their lows, and, you know, you get to know a few of the 12-stepper folks. And I heard them say something similar. And then I realized it actually has a name. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's called the serenity prayer. And let me tell you, that became one of the keys that helped me unlock my worriness. Because I realized I was wanting it to look exactly the way I wanted it to. And let me tell you, if you're any of the hard charger types in this room, you're running a business and you want to, I get it, okay? And the next step I'm going to share with you in a minute is you'll realize this is not about not sowing the right seeds, but what it is about is no longer worrying about it. Did you notice that Jesus didn't say, don't go sow seeds? Jesus didn't say, get dressed. Jesus didn't go through and prohibit people from putting things in barns. What he did say, don't worry about it. That's a big difference. And when we can recognize that we're called in to be people of action, but whenever we're trying to control other people's actions, I got to tell you, and if you haven't learned this lesson yet, it is not going to turn out too well, okay? They have their hopes and dreams too. The best we can do is invite one another to the journey and all of us walk with God, okay? Um, Oh, step five. I, I've, the reason I have to write some of this down. So step one is you have a choice. Step two, alignment. Step three, process focus. Step four, do what is yours to do and leave it to other people to do their part. Step five, be patient. Stay in the game long enough for the results to bear themselves out. I like things to happen quickly, right? I like to go through, and if I make a decision, you know, matter of fact, one of the hardest things that happened is we were buying a car, and they told us it'd take six weeks to deliver it. I didn't come here to buy a car for six weeks from now. I want my car now, right? So like I said, that was only a couple years ago. I have struggled too. The fact of the matter is, is it's our timelines. It is our desires that we want other people to subscribe to that gets us into a lot of trouble. There's a little word for that called ego, okay? Ego. And I've heard this from multiple avenues, but I love when people remind us that ego means edge God out. Edge God out. Because who do we put at the center of our universe? Me, 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 me. That's what the world will tell you. But it's the, 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 the. That's at the center of the Christian's universe. Um, step six, Jesus in the closing line reminded us that tomorrow is going to have worries of its own. Today has worries enough for itself. Do you know right now is the only thing you have? Sure, you can reflect on yesterday. Sure, you can consider and learn lessons from perhaps what has happened in the past. Yes, you can make plans for tomorrow. Yes, you can think ahead just a little bit about what's happening over the coming week, months, years. Don't worry about it. Worries right here, right now. Where are you right now? Friends, the reason why we use that affirmation of faith today, that we believe in God who has created and is creating. Do you notice how big that ing is? God's not finished. And guess where the revelation of God is happening in our lives? It might be tomorrow and I trust God's going to meet us there. 
we might reflect on yesterday and recognize where God is at, but the creating that God is doing is happening right now. And how often are we blinded to what is happening where the moment now is being robbed by our worries of tomorrow? What's going to happen then? Friends, make your plans. Do your work today for tomorrow's reap. But don't worry about it. Pay attention to what's happening right here, right now. I want to end today with uh, two two quotes. Um, I hope that you've found some um, uh, literary coaches in your life. Um, They may or may not be contemporaries in our world today, but there are people you can pick up a book and, man, it's just capital T truth, right? One of those for me, his name is E. Stanley Jones. He was a missionary in India uh, in the last century. He was actually a contemporary of Mahatma Gandhi and um, helped spread the Christian good news and the Wesleyan tradition over there. And uh, but he, he had a wonderful quote, and he said he picked it up from elsewhere, but I'm going to blame it on him. But he said, you must use your hands while praying if an answer you will receive. For prayer-worn knees and a rusty hoe will never raise a big crop. Let me say that again. You must use your hands while praying if an answer you will receive. For prayer-worn knees and a rusty hoe will never raise a big crop. You and I, God has called us into this world. This is not the idea of not worrying about what's going to happen. That doesn't mean you, you know, that's it. I'm selling everything. I'm moving into a van down by the river. That's not our call. What you and I are called to be is people who are free from that worry. And like I said, and I'm still working on this too. But what I'm finding is the more I lean into it, the more God shows up. Okay. So what I want to end with today is, is a, a, a scripture that one of my mentors gave to me a while back. And I, I come back to it uh, pretty regularly. Matter of fact, this morning in my prayer time, uh, it's one of the things I do to, to get my, my, uh, my mind to settle in. And uh, it comes from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 46. And if you've never read through the Psalms, let me tell you, it is the most forced gump part of the Bible. You never know what you're going to get. Okay? Um, some of it's up here. Some of it's out there. Some of it... I'm sure it meant a lot at the time, but this is one that means so much to me. And I want to share that with you. It comes to us from Psalm 46. And it, again, is a very visual um, reading. And if you want to close your eyes again, the deal's still on. I will not think you're asleep. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High for God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. Oh, the nations are in uproar. The kingdoms may totter. His, uh, God utters His voice and the earth melts. But the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then it continues on in verse 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So verse 10 is where I want to end today. And uh, I'm going to read this to you exactly the way I was taught to listen to it. Again, you can close your eyes. You want to take it in, please do so. But hear these words. Where, and think about where does our stillness reside. Be still and know that I am God. 
be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Let us pray. God, you are our peace, you are our strength, you are our refuge. And we mortal creatures have these beautiful gifts of a mind, of imaginations, of thinking over the next horizon. God, sometimes it feels like it gets a little bit out of control, so we're calling upon you today to help us in the way that only you can. You wired us together, you knit us together, and it's in that spirit that we lean into you and ask that you help us remember that our refuge, our rest, is not going to be found in this world, but is found in you in the midst of this world. Help us to shine your light, God. Help us to be a source of strength for those, the, the ethnos, the Gentiles, who still may not know their way home. God, we thank you for this community of faith where we may strengthen for the journey and for the walk that is before us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Are y'all ready to stand up? Please let us rise and body your spirit. I'm going to walk away. Um, as we sing our hymn of invitation, uh, which is uh, hymn number 467, Trust and Obey. If you want to make First United Methodist Church or Rockwall your church home, you can come forward now or you can meet me out in the Northex. We can welcome you. Uh, here in just a few minutes, we're going to show you a, a lot of folks who made it their church home last week. Let's sing. If you're going to come to the Acolyte dedication, come on down. miss one of the most important things we're doing today. I got kind of wrapped up in the sermon there. Um, these are our acolytes who are coming forward to be trained, to be taught, and to help bear the light of Christ for all of us. In the scriptures we find where it says, and a child shall lead them. That's what these young folks are committing themselves to do, to help lead us to walk in the light of Christ. Symbolically, remember, they bring in the light of Christ and they take it back out into the world on your behalf. 
So young people, these folks are here, they're cheering you along. This is the home team, if you will. They want you to do good in this, okay? Yeah. So along those lines, church, will we re- let us rejoice and uh, uh, commit them to service. We rejoice that God has called you to be the bearers of God's light as we worship. May God's Holy Spirit guide you as you serve our congregation. Amen. All right, parents, uh, they're going to be going down to the multipurpose rooms, right, for lunch and for training. Friends, you're going out into the world to be the light, to be the salt. Go be salty. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.